Hello and welcome to Season 4, Episode 7 of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. And we are, of course, reading Alan Ryan's On Politics, a book describing the history of political theory from the ancients until the modern day. And this time we are covering uh, the time period between Augustine and Aquinas, a very big overview of sort of the, the chief political systems in Europe. Uh, definitely very Eurocentric, um, at least this chapter. He kind of dismisses uh, other forms of government. but um, He specifically dismisses Islam. He does. <laughs> and Judaism, and yes. Judaism. Well, they don't really matter much. But I, I think, I guess his focus is really mm-hmm. on Western political yes. thought. Um, and now it's explicit in this chapter. Yes, that he very doesn't explicit. care about any of that other stuff. <laughs> because, well, it's it, only in that it's not relevant to Western political thought, mm-hmm. which I think he's right. So that's made it explicit in this uh, chapter. True. So he's very much focusing, especially on the the Christian politics of the time, focusing on the role of the the papacy and things like that. Uh, which is, is the really... papacy or papacy? I say papacy. I say papacy. You say papacy. Yeah. You say papacy. <laughs> <I> say papacy. <laughs> we are, of course, Let's call in... the whole thing. Yes, exactly. We are in person today, actually, and we will be presumably for next time as well, because uh, oh, yeah. I'll be back home. Right now, we're in my tiny apartment uh, in beautiful northern Missouri. Um, and we are recording this this together because of... Uh, I've made a trip up yes, for litigation have, purposes. For litigation purposes, <laughs> of course. Which, which we won't, uh, won't uh, bother the listener. Right yes, now, probably not. Um, do you have any thoughts beforehand going into this chapter? Anything you wanted to say? Get out there, scream to the to the world. Um, no. No? no All I, right. I, you, I mean, I thought I, I was going to mention the Islam thing later, but... Mm. Uh, but uh, you beat me to the punch. I'm very sorry about that. And then I was going to mention that uh, we're live here in mm-hmm. Cooksville, and you did that mm. too. So now you have no more thoughts for the rest of the episode. <laughs> Those are your two things. Those are my two preliminary thoughts. Mm-hmm. I see. And now I have only actual thoughts. Only actual not, thoughts. No, no pre-thoughts. No potentialities of thoughts. Only actual, actual thoughts. Yeah. Hmm. I guess. Huh. I don't know. Anyway. anyway yes, what about you? Do you have any uh, preliminary thoughts you want to mention? I do not. I usually don't. You usually have something that you want to get out of the way before we start the <laughs> podcast, but uh, not this time, I guess. Uh, no, not today. Not today. Huh. I mean, I, I could, I could. I know. You name a subject, I, know. I can do a rant on. I know if you, you want can. to. And I have, I have my own thoughts and that's and, really all right. Worries about the world, mm-hmm. but they really have nothing to do with this this podcast. Yeah, I was meaning you know specifically for. The podcast. The podcast, No, yes. I have nothing. All you, right. If you keep goading me, I will come <laughs> up with something. <laughs> I think that's a threat. Yes. Uh, but yeah, we're going to start off uh, with the big question of, did medieval political theory exist? And Alan Ryan kind of says there's a lot of you know historians who say it really didn't. There was no you know alternative forms of thinking, uh, but there was definitely political theory. Uh, he says that this chapter focuses less on individual thinkers than on issues of law, property, slavery, and relations between church and state. So it's not really like, here's what this guy said, and here's what this guy said. It's more of an overview of how it actually functioned. And, and you know, I, I guess I would say, I guess maybe this is a preliminary, but um, a lot of the concepts he talks about as far as property law and individual rights, um, and, and he's talking about the common law and the feudal system, a lot of them carried over mm-hmm. uh, to the, the United States through the English common law. So a lot of these concepts, uh, you know, of season, I'm de- I deal with um, uh, the season of title mm-hmm. uh, in land litigation, land ownership litigation all the time. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of them going on right now. So it's, it's just kind of funny to see, you know, a, a political history book talking about the Middle Ages mm-hmm. and these things kind of carried through as far as possession and as opposed to as opposed to the uh, title ownership mm-hmm. and all that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and he kind of says, you know, the rise of the Roman Empire is really, you know, where we get the question of whether there were politics at all. Because we're looking at, like, the ancient Greek thinkers, and they're saying politics can only exist, you know, in comparison to other systems. But if we only have one overarching system kind of governing the whole thing, is there really politics? Um, and when those Roman empires became Christian, uh, they did not deify themselves per se, but they did everything short of it. Uh, so the the papacy then copied the thrones the tiara the robes of the empire formed a college of cardinals similar to the senate and so that's really what we're seeing is one of the biggest political forces uh, and there was actually no settled view of the pope's appointment until 1059 uh, and at that point it became election by the college of cardinals which i think is an issue we'll get into uh, later in the chapter yeah, it's, uh, it's a reminder of how corrupt our current system is mm-hmm. and how we really could change it if we wanted to yeah. as, meaning as catholics yes i mean i don't know if the listener is catholic i've never asked the listener mm. <laughs> we haven't conversed about that, but uh, but the, you know when he mentions you know the College of Cardinals, that, that wasn't how how the the Pope was mm-hmm. selected before. There's no reason why we can't change it. Yeah, exactly. 
So the existence of one institution of the papacy alongside a quilt of kingdoms no, you raised... said papacy. I did say papacy. Which was right. Which is co- incorrect. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize for my statements. Uh, but the, the existence of this one institution alongside a quilt of smaller kingdoms raised a new question. Uh, were kings to appoint bishops or popes to appoint kings? You know, who has the power over the other? Um, and so really what we saw here is that all of these questions are still drawing on classical philosophy. Uh, and he kind of mentions what you were mentioning earlier, that the roots of our modern representative governments come from the European Middle Ages, but we think of them in ways borrowed from the Greeks and Romans. So a lot of the language that we look at uh, comes directly from the Greeks and the Romans, but a lot of the systems have their roots in the, the European Middle Ages. And, and it really is a, a blessing that there was this separation, you know, where, where people had to think about, okay, well, you have this, you have the the Pope and, mm-hmm. and, and the church structure, but then you have the, um, you know, the civil the civil king, you know, who's not a deity or mm-hmm. a quasi-deity or whatever. Um, and you had to think about that. Of course, you had to think about that as a philosopher and, and a political scientist in, um, in Israel uh, or Jew- Jerusalem or whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it at the time when they were conquered by Rome because they had their church authorities and then they also had the Roman authorities that were, you know, a different system over them, which wasn't the government. And so I think we probably would have benefited from, uh, you know, examining some of that and mm-hmm. some of the, the Islam um, because they, you know, they, they're, I'm sure there are Islamic scholars that wrestled with the duty yeah. to the civil authorities um, separate from Allah, mm-hmm. you know, the God and all that stuff. And, um, but anyways, mm-hmm. I just want to mention that. Yeah, it kind of points to some specific examples. He says the British parliamentary government of today comes from a king and council system that we saw beginning in the Middle Ages, um, while the U.S. kind of inserted this almost exact system into a republic based on Ciceronian ideals is kind of how he describes it, which is an interesting way, uh, but I'm sure we'll get to the U.S. uh, later on in this book. Sure. And he says that the mixed government aligns with the medieval idea that the king should rule with the advice of an aristocratic council and consent for taxation from a body representing the commons. Uh, so that, that Polybian idea of, you know, the different parts doing different things, this mixed government all kind of in one um, definitely carries through very specifically with the king and then the council and the commons, essentially. Yeah. Not exactly a division of authority, mm-hmm. but um, some accountability. Yes. So, know, some, some parts feedback. have to come from something else. Yeah, so, so that... You know, if the, if the king w- went off the reservation, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, to our Native American ancestors, um, uh, <laughs> uh, reference to that. Yes, of uh, course. But uh, oh, I was thinking about something about that the other day. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, well, it's Columbus Day. Yes. Should we mention yeah, that? Yeah. I, I was going to say, Ann Coulter had a, I had a, didn't get through the whole column, but she had a kind of an interesting column, um, a Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Mm. And uh, she is has a very caustic wit when it comes to indigenous peoples mm. because the sub headline was um, be thankful that we are not uh, in a world where we have no written language, no movable type, no wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Cause they didn't even have the wheel uh, and some other things. It was, it was a funny column. So I, I should insert that. Maybe that should have been my preliminary thought. So I was, maybe I, I feel like, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's on brand for you. I think, I think <laughs> that's, that's nothing that's, to do with <laughs> nothing. I feel like you were going to say something too, and then you completely derailed whatever you're going to say with whatever that thought was. I, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah. I was there, talking about mixed government, not necessarily, you know, and you said not necessarily separate powers, but different like the powers have yeah to have not some separation consent. of powers yes. i mean the, the king had all the authority but there's some sort of uh, modified accountability mm-hmm. and and uh, if the king went off the reservation yes that's that's where, that's that's where, where i lost we the train of thought <laughs> then there is kind of a system to overthrow him or check mm-hmm. him or and try to influence him to get back on the reservation yes. where he belongs <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Just joking. They did not. I, I completely do not think they belonged on reservation. Yes. All right. Thank you for that disclaimer. Uh, but that's actually a good segue into this next section, which, you know, is the medieval conceptions of authority. You know, what did they think about the authority? Who has it? Um, and so this is where we kind of see the first description of the feudal institutions. Uh, and they combined ascending authority, which is authority granted by the people and kind of goes upwards, and descending authority, which is that authority is an inherent in the ruler. Uh, and it kind of trickles down that way. Um, to combine these two theories um, in an interesting way. Uh, but he says that between the deposition uh, of the last Roman Empire, Romulus Augustus, in 476 and the end of World War II, some form of one-man rule was the most common form of government in Europe. So pretty much every country, or most countries, I guess I should say, uh, that existed in Europe from 476 to the end of World War II had some sort of 
single man ruler, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. I don't know if that's true. Mm hmm. Because, well, I mean, there was a rise of the fascist dictators, mm -hmm. Mussolini and Hitler, um, and uh, what's a guy in Spain, Franco. Mm. Uh, but they had a republic in France. Yeah. They had a, a constitutional monarchy in, um, in England. They mm -hmm. did have a republic, uh, you know, the Weimar Republic in Germany. Yeah. And Hitler was elected. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I think in Italy, I'm trying to remember what, what form they had government they really had effectively before Mussolini mm -hmm. kind of took over to control. But I would say shortly before World War II, I think that's accurate mm -hmm. because they had kings and all that. But, you know, the French Revolution was, was in the 1700s. Yeah. So, um, and, and there was a constitutional market, mm -hmm. monarchy of sorts in England before that. Yeah. Um, they had a House of Lords, you know, they, they had limited, I mean, the Magna Carta, what was that, 16 something? I think around the, um, maybe 14 I think something. it's referenced in here. I always forget I know it the is. date. It yeah. might be 14 something. You, you, 1492 right. maybe. Uh, that is the number that's, that's that I'm saying. That's, that's, that's when that's Columbus, Columbus sailed. It's yes, Columbus that's, Day. That's, Happy that's, Columbus Day. <laughs> 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 I mean, Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes, yes, of course. Um, so, but I think mm -hmm. he's right that hundreds of years went by mm -hmm. uh, where you had single man rule. Yeah. Always a man. Well, not always. I guess there were some, there, there's some, queens. some queens. There's some queens. That's true. Yeah. From that time all the way mm -hmm. up to the, almost the modern era. Yes. and then he Pretty goes, amazing. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say that most political units were small, but in the year 800, Pope Leo II crowned Charlemagne as Emperor of the Romans. Uh, and he's got a good quote in here. Uh, this first iteration of the Holy Roman Empire was short-lived. In 962, the German Otto become, became emperor, and the continuous history of an institution mocked by Voltaire as neither holy nor Roman nor an empire began. Its basis was Germany, but the emperor's status was elective, and the geographical Germany contained a multitude of diverse political entities, ranging from prince bishoprics to kingdoms to free cities that were finally swept away only in the 19th century, when Germany was forcibly unified by Prussia. Uh, so very interesting, because we'll be focusing mm -hmm. pretty much um, consistently on the Holy Roman Empire throughout this episode, but um, the fact that it was not, you know, necessarily, well, holy in, in Voltaire's opinion, but definitely not really an empire or Roman at all. Um, yeah, it was Germanic. It was Germanic. At that point, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, the, the emperor was elected by some means, so not really, you know, what we would consider an emperor, um, but um, an interesting institution. Yeah. And then I guess we're going to get into it, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the role between or the struggle between the religious authority and the civil authority yeah. and how they, how they had to deal with, okay, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to, you know, like the Pope would have to coronate the king, but what if he refused, mm -hmm. you know, and I guess would the king make him, you know, or kill yeah. him and appoint somebody else and who, who who's in charge of all the stuff? But I guess that's really what we're talking about mm -hmm. a little later in the chapter. Yeah. So he kind of says that, you know, this is really what we're seeing is, is descending authority for the most part here. Correct. Um, but he said that there were certain subordinate institutions such as universities, guilds, and communes that practiced forms of self-government, but they often rationalized their rights of self-government as gifts from a superior authority. So still, it wasn't even truly, you know, the powers from the people. It's that the power was given to us by somebody more powerful than us. Yeah, and, and even, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on these abbeys and, and these... Um, uh, brothers and all that stuff mm -hmm. but they always had like a an abbot yeah you know the head guy or, or the mother for a nunnery mm -hmm. no convent convent yes uh, well, maybe, maybe nunnery both. too yeah. yeah um and so they always had a, a, a mother and the sisters you know there, there's always there and that's a top-down structure mm -hmm. that's coming for so that's certainly descending rather than ascending yeah. i think the ascending really started with you know the the, the american revolution mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, you got to give the, the French credit for the beginning of the French yeah. Revolution, which devolved into murder and chaos <laughs> um, and horrible, horrible. Uh, the Jacobins are just uh, God's or Satan's gift to mm. uh, history. But yeah. anyway, but yeah, so yeah. I, mean, I think I think I think he's talking about like the communism. I, mm -hmm. I, I think I mentioned this in a prior podcast about well, I took a tour of a uh, was, it, was it a monastery? Was it an yeah. yeah, abbot? I what think I, the way you told it last monks. time was a monastery. Yeah. Monks. Yeah. yeah. Monks in a monastery. And they said, oh, we share everything. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but he had like a, I think, so was it a watch? It was some sort of like expensive item. And, um, and I, I said, well, who's that? You know, and, mm -hmm. and, and oh, that's a gift for my mom or whoever yeah. it was. And um, I don't know if I asked or if I just thought, hmm. well, no, I think I asked, well, what, 
Is that yours? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's mine. Like, okay, well, then you're not a communist. <laughs> well, then you're a true communist, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is I get mine and you share yours. <laughs> that's the definition of communism. <laughs> He he does kind of mention to get back to the book that in the 14th century. That is a reference to the book. Yes, I know. He mentions how they I know, but you're skipping ahead a little bit. You're oh, skipping I'm ahead sorry. a little bit. Yes, uh, he says the in the 14th century, Marsilius of Padua was kind of the first one to provide a clear formulation of the doctrine that rulers rule by consent of their subjects. Uh, but even still, at that point, he was arguing that what the subjects do is choose who best to rule them. Mm-hmm. So it's not really that they right. are ruling themselves; they just right. have the power. Um, it is through their consent that they choose their ruler. Right. And it really is revolutionary to think that the people have the power, that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that, and, and it's, it's a threat yeah. to the aristocracy mm-hmm. and to the, the rulers that we're giving you the power mm-hmm. and we can take it back. Yeah. And that is that is literally revolutionary. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of mentions that the Christian worldview, which of course was the dominant one, um, was that the authority essentially transcended political authority too, because all authority essentially came from God uh, and was divinely ordained. And that's a concept we'll get into a little bit later. Um, well, we'll get into it now. Oh, you know, go ahead. Like, uh, you know, like uh, where Jesus said, you know, mm-hmm. uh, give, give to, to Caesar, Caesar yeah. what, what is Caesar, right? And I think, well, I'm not going to say he, he made a mistake, <laughs> but, but that, that certainly uh, people took that in a way that that uh, certainly strengthened the hand of uh, the brutal leaders mm-hmm. because you know that that side of the of the world is for the civil leaders and do what you're told mm-hmm. Jesus said so and um, and I think a lot of people made a lot of mischief yeah. all over that as far as who's who's the ultimate authority uh, for a, a huge sphere of life mm-hmm. and uh, and they, and really um, they don't have any authority any any more than what we give them yeah but Mm-hmm. They didn't think that at the time. Yeah, we'll get it's, into the. It's a dangerous thing to uh, idea to put into print mm-hmm. back then, or yeah. just to share. Yeah, before we get into the the passive obedience idea, he kind of mentions a, a description of you know the, the two Roman empires at this point. We mentioned mm, briefly right. that they were starting to split uh, around the time of Augustine, uh, but they were drifting further apart, and the impact of the East Roman Empire was very limited. Um, there was a faint prospect until about 1040 that the Byzantines might invade the rest of Italy, mm-hmm. uh, but they did not. Um, he says, you know, points to a lot of outside influences on the East Empire, you know, the Slavics and the Muslim em- uh, enemies. Uh, and there was a massive language difference, too. Latin became the language of the West and Greek became the language of the East. So even just communicating ideas wasn't too frequent um, just due to the language difference. Uh, and then the Western Europe uh, claimed inheritance of Rome with Charlemagne. Um, and then the, the Byzantine Empire was somewhat dismembered by those Slavic and Muslim enemies in and the I Eastern think, Church. I think if I remember drifted. correctly, like the uh, rulers in Russia, uh, the Tsars, mm-hmm. uh, at one point claimed to be heirs to the Holy Roman mm-hmm. Empire. Probably. I, yeah. I think like everybody well, in Europe claimed to be uh, heirs of the Holy Roman Did you Roman know that the word Tsar comes from the, the word Caesar? Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's actually just a direct connection there. They're right. claiming, well, we're the new Caesars, right. the Tsars. Yes. I find it offensive that sometimes we appoint people to certain, like the like Reagan appointed a person to be in charge of drug issues, and it was the drug czar. Mm. I just thought that it was very offensive, <laughs> and that was back during the Cold War. Yeah, I mean, why are we why are we calling people czar? Yeah, that's that's really offensive to us. Yeah, I'm not a not a fan of yeah. czars. Even the communists didn't like the czar. No, they did not. <laughs> they did not. <laughs> but we would agree with the czar that we all hate the communists. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, he kind of mentions um, also the, the theological differences here, too. By the too. way, I heard there's a communist uh, club there on is, campus. There has been an increasingly uh, present communist oh, club on campus. They Will I be able to meet any while I'm here? I'm sure I are could they, find some. Are they going to have an event or like a, uh, didn't you say they're going to have like a table? Somewhere? That was on Friday. Oh, I uh, missed it. You missed it. You missed it. And, uh, and, and it gotten just promptly took, kicked off of campus. I could have taken all of their flyers mm. because, you know, they don't have any ownership of it. That's true. This is for everybody. They've been. Do they have any stuff to give out? What do they do? I don't know. Well, I, I st- they said they'd be out there for an hour and a half from like 4 to 5.30. I went by at like 5.15 and they weren't there. So evidently they were not there for and very PM long. PM on a Friday? PM on a Friday of homecoming week. Oh my God. So I don't think they planned it very well. Um, <laughs> but they were just there. They were like, come meet us. And I guess they had some things to hand out. Um, we got a, a, a copy of the, of the People's Paper, actually, oh, um, nice. separate from, from the tabling. Um, somebody I know ran into one of them and was like, hey, we saw you you post about this on Instagram. Do you have a copy? And um, it was something. A um, lot of praising of Che Guevara, uh, particularly. Mm. Lots of praising of the IRA. Uh, oh, but they really love 
Che Guevara. They posted a, a video. Know, che Guevara and... murdered homosexuals. Yes, I know, and that's 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 one of the things that's so strange to we me. We gotta get the LGBT people after them Ooh, communists. We could, we could. Uh, but they posted like a video of one of their members. There's like a bridge that connects two of our buildings over there. Um, of him with a big Che Guevara flag, just running like back and forth on it, and they had like nice. the Che Guevara, some sort of anthem playing in the background. Oh, nice. And then a few yeah. days later, they posted something like, "Here are our ideals," and like one of the the top ones was like support of lgbtq communities and i'm like <laughs> you are flying a flag of che guevara you know what we need to do we need to have we could have it made special a uh, che guevara flag big thing uh-huh. uh, a big one we could put on a big pole and on, underneath it we could have don't say gay <laughs> <laughs> like in quotes because you know he'd say that <laughs> <laughs> and they'd, they don't know what the hell is, well, what is that i'd have to I, I could i could carry it around campus i'd have to get some dirt you know some dirty clothes uh, you know like uh, from goodwill or something oh well, goodwill's nicer now but you know like secondhand clothes mm-hmm. you, know, you know maybe pull them out of a dumpster get a wig with like matted hair and you know and you know, run around campus hey man <laughs> oh that's great I don't um, know who would be more upset. Would it be the communists or the LGBT people? And they'd both be confused mm-hmm. at first. They'd be stunned. What is this? I would say probably the LGBT people. Um, because the words. Because the words. The words. Also, I'm not entirely sure just how serious the communists are. Because sometimes uh. they seem serious, but it's like they're doing something so absurd. It's like, I cannot believe you're oh. actually doing this. because like It's like a Monty Python yeah. thing. Yeah, because I was when you were talking about this, I was thinking we need to have our own people's paper. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, like a rival to the people's yes. paper and say that they aren't pure enough. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We'll be the real people's paper and we can publish it and like and like steal their papers and, and publish our own papers that are like, all we would uh, do is spend their entire time condemning the people's paper because we're the real people's paper. <laughs> that we're the real communists. Now that, that would be that good. That's an idea. That's great. That, that's Because fantastic. that's what happens in real life. Yes, of course. But first you're supposed to have joined them and then you splinter off, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. because they all they can't stand each yeah. other. They hate each other more than they hate anybody else. They hate everybody else. Yeah. Well, the Especially thing is, their dads, if they're around. Like, have you ever heard of the app called Yik Yak? I have. Yeah, but it's, I don't know. It's like an anom- it. anonymous anybody like within five miles. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so uh, every once in a while, I check it because people say crazy things. Yeah. But even the communists are hating the communists on campus because oh, there's like a whole is. distinction, whole argument about well, we're not you know tankies. We're not you know the ones who support these terrible people. We're the real communists. The tankies. What's tankies. A, what's tankies? Th- that's that's like somebody who who supports you know like the the communism of of China essentially oh. like you know. Oh. Oh, because of the, the, the... The tanks. The, uh, whatchamacallit, the... Uh, Tiananmen, Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square. Yes, yes. Like the really suppressive uh, so they're communists. So the, the, the Chinese are the real communists. Uh, not according to, to the, the real communists. To the non-tanky <laughs> communists. Yes. That's great. Yeah, no, but there's like just like pages almost of just oh. them arguing back and forth like and then somebody will interject and like well i'm a socialist and i think this and then both yes. of the communists get them and they're like <laughs> yes, well that's yes. on the path to communism <laughs> you're actually one of us uh, fantastic yeah it's it's something it is it is a do show you think, do you think that maybe they are a, a, like a farce like an on purpose i can't tell because i really can't tell on a friday of homecoming <laughs> that's brilliant and then they don't show up yeah. I and mean, that's I mean that's some comedic ge- yeah. genius there, yeah. And I a Shake Guevara thing, yeah. and the first thing is LBGT. There's something <laughs> going on there. There's somebody that knows what they're doing. And now, as president of the Republican Club, I think you should be able to. You should know some of these people that are that, that kind of yeah. high level uh, mocking. Uh huh. But but the thing is, I cannot tell. I cannot tell if they're actually mocking. Well, that's, that's, that's the, the the best way to do it. That is true. That is true. And then after true. it, you know, just have to keep getting carried away. But, but boy, I'm not kidding. We we should start the real people's paper mm. uh, and the real like the real communist. Underline it, italicize it. Bold, or the real communist club of uh, of uh, uh, of Truman University. Right? Yes. Are they a recognized club? The communists. Mm-hmm. They are an official club. So we would we would not form an mm-hmm. official club. Mm. Uh, because we are not going to be uh, asserting that they that the the university has any authority over us. Mm. We're communists. We are not going to seek approval of authority mm. like those other communists. We're the real communist party, <laughs> right? Yes, exactly. 
Yes. Exactly. That's that's our first edition of, of the real people's paper. <laughs> the real people's paper. That's fantastic. You can't condemn them. Oh, yes. Right. You're looking at your watch. Am I getting too far? No, 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 no. I just got a got a All notification. Right. But yes, I, we should I, we should get back to. I'm the, not. The, I'm not point. kidding. I I think this is a brilliant plan. I should float it to the club. I mean, I did mention like actually just putting out our own kind of paper, but more seriously. You know, no, just something. No, no, yeah, no, no. The not now that I think about it. Yeah, paper. That'd be great. That'd be great. And, and and you could you could get take like do have you gotten a copy of theirs? Somebody I don't have it personally, but yeah. I know somebody who does. So what you need to do is like they're going to be crazy, but then you go like another degree crazy <laughs> and condemn them for not being another degree crazy. Oh, oh yes. yeah, yeah, and, and say they aren't the real communists mm-hmm. because the real communists believe in sharing everything, and they won't share. So I don't even no, you know. Name it. Yeah, I'd like to see what the bylines are. Do they do they attribute? an author because if they attribute stories to an author that's not the true communist way it should be a collective well, it should be a collective statement the funny thing about that is is they refer to themselves yes. the authors yes as comrade last name they are absolutely making fun of communists there's no way they're, they're but the thing themselves is, com- but the com- thing is, comrade the, the only edition that they have i think they're making a new one but the edition that they have is from february of 22 and that's the copy that we got and so it's like, this is in the past, and this is before that this club was officially the communist. Just this semester, they used to be the Progressive Student Alliance, and before that they were Students for Democratic Society, um, but now they are officially communist. They've always been communists. Do you really think that somebody is, is without irony, calling themselves comrades? Yes. Really? Yes. I, I can see it. God, I can absolutely see it. gold. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I hope it's a joke, well, but I, I don't I, think it is. I shouldn't encourage you to do this, but I would absolutely, if I was in college, I would mm-hmm. absolutely join that group. Mm. But I would, sh- but of course, you could either do it one of two ways. You either go there and you dress full commie weirdo, mm. you know, Che Guevara t-shirt, you know, like the, <laughs> what is it, a beret or whatever, yeah. you know, something like, you know, like a stereotypical commie hipster type dude, mm-hmm. or you go in like a, a, a formal suit. Mm. <laughs> I would like to join your communist club. <laughs> I've heard great things about you. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Uh, one or the other. Yes. Or you just go and say, hey, I want to be a communist. <laughs> Can you tell me more about this? It sounds interesting. And they say, we'll share everything. Say, I like that computer. Can you share that with me? And they just take it and leave. <laughs> and what are they going to do? Call the police? <laughs> Oppressors! Oppressors! <laughs> you are oppressing me! How could I steal it? No one has any property. All right, that is, that is enough about the communists. You are not a victim. I'm the victim of your oppression. We need to get back to the book. <laughs> so, Alan Ryan also talks about the, the theological... We got here from the Holy Roman Empire. Yes. Um, uh, about the theological differences between the two empires. Uh, the Western was very Trinitarian. Uh, Greek Christianity did not regard the Holy Spirit as a third person of God. Uh, and there was a final breach between the churches in 1054 that still somewhat remains unhealed. Uh, but the important well, political part... issues with uh, the statues, like mm-hmm. veneration of uh, almost idolatry. Yeah. So, you, so if you see the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Church, they're not going to have any of those statues mm-hmm. of Mary and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but one of the, the biggest political issues was that the Eastern Emperor's appointment, um, uh, he appointed the Patriarch of Constantinople, um, and that is exactly what the Western Church wanted to avoid, uh, because the Emperor held supreme authority there, uh, essentially a form of a Pope or, or a high religious authority was the well, Patriarch know, of Constantinople. Uh, uh, Putin has a, appointed the uh, Archbishop of Kiev mm. uh, in that area, and he's been supporting the war. Of course, he's a he's a Russian uh, stooge. Of course. But in the in the tradition of the you know the, uh, the Eastern Church dating back to that, the king would uh, appoint those uh, mm-hmm. those bishops and those those rulers, and yeah, and of course it turned out to be a complete total hack. But. Mm-hmm. Um, and he does say that there were instances in the West where the Pope was installed and removed by German or French kings. He says there was even one point in time where the papal court was moved to Avignon in the 14th century to be kept under supervision of the French king. Uh, but these were aberrations; they were not the intended purpose of the system. Um, and he says that the papacy's aim was to preserve its freedom of political action within the West. And that was really what they were trying to do yep, at this point in time. Maintain their power. Yes. And then we get in, uh, like we were talking about earlier, about the passive obedience and, you know, 
who who judges you know who is correct in, in where are you at of, i'm well, well past that i am on page 198 oh my god i'm well past that <laughs> we gotta keep moving it's gonna be a four hour long uh, maybe passive obedience i already were talked about that no not yet uh he says that the Ooh. the powers that be are ordained by god uh, but this does not answer all the questions of a political society uh, in particular the relationship between god's government of the universe and any given uh monarch's title to rule you know where does that that path go how do they have this title to rule if god's you know the supreme ruler um and so how a ruler came to be in charge did not matter to augustine uh, like we talked about last time because um, he, he viewed us as a fallen world and so what you yes know, exactly soul, really. uh, and of course this did not satisfy the subjects of the new kings of europe uh, he says that damnation is the lot of the disobedient. We must respect the office, but not the office holder. But this does not answer whether an incumbent ruler ruled by right, uh, because some kings were tyrants and murderers. You know, at what point can we disobey? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the view until the 16th century was pretty Augustinian, um, passive disobedience only when rulers required repudiation of Christ. Right. Uh, and rigorous, therefore, claimed that embracement of martyrdom was necessary among Christians, while others... Uh, held that God considers our hearts, and so we can repudiate Christ in speech, but follow him in our hearts um, in order to stay alive, essentially. Yeah, and I, I, I thought it was, I don't know if it's in this section, but he, it's kind of an interesting statement about how the the Romans thought that the, uh, the early Christians were a little bit too eager to be <laughs> martyred. Um, and, 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 but if you really think uh, that this this world is just a... Uh, a short period of suffering before mm-hmm. you get to the uh, to to heaven, mm-hmm. then uh, and and a martyrdom guarantees the ticket. You know, yeah. you'd think you'd well, jump at the opportunity, yeah. and that's what the rigorists believed. Um, and that's, so, from that's what I believe, but I'm not really, you know, yeah. it's, it's like what is it? Kenny Chesney says uh, uh, something about um, not today. Like oh, I don't know. There's I don't know what you're talking he, about. He has a song that says. Uh, Everybody knows that want, everybody everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want to go now. Mm, yes, that is true. Right. Uh, he then says that the popes then claimed that they could release the subjects of a king from allegiance on the grounds of heresy or moral turpitude. Uh, and if the king was excommunicated, then the duty of obedience was at an end. Um, but after the Reformation, these heresy depositions held little weight. You know, if you don't care what the church says, you know, you're not going to follow what they say if yeah. they, they claim you're a heretic. I think the, pro- the biggest problem was the, the uh, church was so corrupt itself, and they were so mm-hmm. intertwined and interrelated with uh, the civil authorities that they didn't have the moral authority to say, you know, sinner yeah. to the king and say, what about those four mistresses you had? Yeah, back exactly. Um, and he does say that the private individuals are not to decide for themselves if a king was worthy to be deposed. Um, and so then if a king is answerable to a body, who constitutes it? Uh, and this is kind of where we have the feudal system of land tenure giving rise to the idea that the authority of rulers existed on terms and by consent. Uh, and so essentially how this operated was that a tenant swore allegiance and owed military service in return for secure occupancy of his land and impartial justice from his lord. Uh, so, you, so you can occupy this land, you can use it, uh, but you owe a lot of things to that lord. Um, and you kind of extend this all the way up uh, because at the apex of the hierarchy was the king. And perhaps he could be judged by leading figures of the feudal kingdom, but it's unclear how to enforce uh, the views without, you know, civil war. If you think your king's being, you know, unjust, how do you stop him from being unjust, if Correct. not, you know, in full-out war? Right. Uh, and by the end of the 14th century, many wanted both popes and kings to be judged by those with whose advice and consent they governed. Um, so, you know, if, if you're making decisions for me, then I have a, a right to, to have some say on what you do if I don't like your decisions. Yep, and... Uh... But just as an aside, mm-hmm. there, there's a, a concept of sovereign immunity. Yeah. That means the king is above the law. Mm-hmm. And that actually continues to this day in the United States. Mm-hmm. So political subdivisions have sovereign immunity, literally, in the Missouri Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. So they're, unless they otherwise exempt themselves from the sovereign immunity, they're not subject to any civil litigation. Hmm. So the only reason why you can sue the police for violating your civil rights is because there's a they call it a 1983 action, which you might have seen in the, the news media. Well, that's based upon Section 1983 of the Federal Code, which hmm. authorizes and waives that um, uh, that sovereign immunity. Interesting. And it's, it says, you know, these are uh, constitutional violations, so you're entitled to monetary uh, compensation. Before that, you were not entitled to it because there's sovereign immunity. You can't sue hmm. the sovereign. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. That so is interesting. It still continues to this day. Yes. A lot of arguments over that now. I because bet. the police... Uh, the, the police issues, and then then the question is, if you're a police officer, should should you be uh, risking not only your career, your life, but yeah. also civil judgments against you if you make a mistake? But mm-hmm. 
Anyway, very interesting. Yes, moving on uh, from there, we get into this discussion of, of popes and kings and their sort of relationship there. Uh, and like you mentioned earlier, the Gospels were read to imply that Christ had given Peter the power to bind and loose. And so essentially this um, continued on through the popes in that the decisions of moral fitness, if not practical competence of kings, were for the church to make. He can bind and loose any institution. He can free people from um, you know, cooperating with it, essentially. And this gave the pope the authority to depose kings, uh, ratione peccati, for reasons of sinfulness, but this cut both ways. I'm going to read here from the book. A danger of doing so from their point of view was that the thought that all authority comes from God can cut the other way. Christ was both king and priest. Kings were anointed during their coronations to symbolize the divine origin of their authority. If kings are ordained of God, this suggests that kings may possess authority over or within the church. If popes may depose kings, ratione peccati, it opens the way to kings deposing popes for breaches of canon law or mismanagement of the church, which... I mean, logically, that makes sense. You know, if we both have our power from God, why do you have more power than I do? Shouldn't you be held to the same standard? Uh, But there was no constitutional mechanism for peaceful and lawful deposition. Uh, When cases were made, they were usually about the ill-gotten methods of acquiring the office, not performance itself. Um, So they really did not focus on whether they were really being morally correct, just if they got to to their power in the right way. Yeah, you're not the true king. Yes. It's your brother who is older Mm -hmm. than you. Yes, just like, you know. Not the true people's paper. We are the real people's paper. Totally we each have a claim. Comedy gold there, man. <laughs> uh, but the papacy uh, presented difficulties with this. Uh, each pope received authority directly from Christ, so each pope was absolute, and this seemed to rule out both deposition and resignation uh, because each had supreme power to bind and loose. Why can that power be used on them if they have the ultimate authority was their argument, essentially. So then we get into this discussion of natural law and conventional law. Um, in that God is a lawgiver, but the fall poses problems to the relationships of divine, natural, and conventional law. Can man ever know what the law is, and how do we know he will obey it, rather than look for ways to avoid its requirements? Uh, and so this led to Christian thinkers inheriting the question of whether natural law lay behind conventional law, uh, which changes based on locality. Is it the law because it is the word of a ruler, local custom, or because it accords with uh, the natural law? And I'm going to read from the book here, if I could find where I wanted to read from. Um, When General Sir Charles Napier in the 19th century tried to prohibit the practice of sati, or widow burning, in India, he was met with the reply that local custom demanded it. He responded by pointing out that British custom demanded the hanging of those who murdered women. Augustine would doubtless have thought widows who willingly immolated themselves, if they did, were guilty of murder, too. The inherited tradition pointed medieval thinkers in the same directions as modern legal theory. On one view, law is the word of a sovereign lawgiver, and on the other, law follows the dictates of reason for the welfare of mankind. Uh, And I think that kind of ties into what we've talked about several times, the the malum per se and the malum prohibitum. Is it wrong because I say so? Is it wrong because it is inherently wrong? Well, and and this is a hot topic. It doesn't sound like a hot topic. Mm -hmm. It's a huge topic right now, natural law. And what is the the fundamental foundation of our legal system? Mm -hmm. And that's being challenged. Uh, now, like never before in American yeah. history, it really is. It and and and, it, and it's hard question to answer because you know, like Plato and and I think Aristotle too uh, had the view that y- you can figure out natural law mm-hmm. through reason, um, and and uh, basically it's the natural order of things yeah. uh, which are and then are you know the Christians would say which are set in motion by our Creator, mm-hmm. and so there's you know there's laws of physics, there's laws of science and engineering and all that stuff. So there's no reason why there wouldn't be laws, uh, natural law, as far as individual rights, Mm -hmm. um, personal freedom and being free from, you know, attack and and private property and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have, I'm sorry, uh, banging my microphone. If you don't have some sort of foundational understanding that, that the, the government isn't giving you those Mm -hmm. rights, uh, uh, and those responsibilities, but they, they are within you, um, either, just from the mere fact of birth or from this natural law concept, mm-hmm. everything can be taken away. Yeah. And, and so that, that was a fundamental concept, I think, of, of the American Constitution. And, and I think it really is being challenged because they just want to be able to, to have these procedural rules mm-hmm. for everything. And whatever the majority rules is what the rights yeah. you have and what the law is. Mm-hmm. It's dangerous. And he kind of uses... Like as an example of that, the distinction between Justinian's uh, view of the law and Cicero's, he says, Justinian wrote this corpus juris civilis, 
Um, this idea of descending authority, law is the reflection of the ruler's will. When the king speaks, he makes law, and that's essentially the end of it. Right. Uh, but Cicero uh, kind of put out two different definitions, the lex naturae, uh, a law intelligible to all rational creatures for the sake of uh, civilities, justice, and common good. Uh, and then this idea of jus gentium, kind of combined with jus civile, uh, the law of one particular si society or the common law of, of a society of nations, essentially our customs versus right. what is inherent in us. And he points to the, the issue of property rights to give us an example of that. Uh, the Lex Naturae dictated that uh, there must be some laws governing acquisition, use, and disposable, disposal of useful material things. But it doesn't explicitly outline what those laws are, just that there has to be some sort of law about them. Uh, and then the Jus Gentium uh, is that there is private property, there's acquisition by labor and purchase, and there's uh, you know specified family members as heirs. And he kind of throws slavery in there, too. And that slavery is part of the use gentium, but not part of the lex naturae. Um, but that doesn't make it inherently bad. Um, you know, the, the customs that we do have as people aren't inherently wrong, but they are these things that we do have, uh, essentially. What? Is that, that confusing? That yes. was probably very confusing. Well, so, uh... so property rights, you know, lex naturae says that there has to be some rules. We all know that the property is valuable, but it doesn't say what those rules are. Mm -hmm. The use gentium is the rules decided on by us as a people a that custom. can be tied to lex naturae, right. um, but they are uh, not inherent within uh, the lex naturae. Got and it. slavery is a part of that. Yes. So slavery, good, not, slavery not in lex naturae, but in use gentium. Property rights encompass both. Right. Because Basically. Yes, exactly. Right, right, right. right. Yes. That's a good explanation. Yes. Thank you. Got yes. When we got there to the, to the end. I've, I've, I've come to the uh, conclusion mm -hmm. that uh, I used to think property rights were not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. I thought, why is everybody, why, why are the founders talking about property rights? Why is it such a big deal? But without property rights, you don't have a functioning society. Hmm. Uh, yeah. and you really don't. And, and it's, it's so f uh, fundamental because if you think about, okay, uh, what do you have in mm -hmm. life? Well, you have your loved ones, but you don't really have them. They're yeah. individuals. You have necessary food, shelter, and clothing. Mm -hmm. And and so and then you build out from there. And so you need the, to have the individual right, unassailable right, to possess those mm -hmm. things and then to accumulate things and then to give them to the, who you want to give yeah. them to in, in the... And, and so I think if you don't have property rights, you don't have freedom because mm -hmm. you're at the mercy of the government mm -hmm. Because you, you don't have the ability to, to store food, yeah. for crying out loud. So you have to have some sort of understanding in order to have a functioning society of individual property rights that mm. can't be taken from you without just compensation, which is the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, I yeah. guess that makes a lot of sense. I know, I do sometimes. <laughs> and then speaking of private property, here's where we get into the origins and justification of private property. Uh, and this is very interesting. Um, this is where he mentions that the earliest Christian communities expected an imminent second coming, and so they practice a very simple communism where members pooled resources and took what they needed. Uh, but by the turn of the millennium, the papacy owned a great deal of property and was a powerful political institution. Uh, it was actually the most legally sophisticated institution of Western Europe. So very big difference from the, the, the early Christians uh, until the turn of the millennium. Uh, and between the fall and God's kingdom, uh, this is kind of where he talks about slavery as well. Uh, slavery is just another unfortunate consequence of the fall. And the early churches, in fact, employed slaves um, and masters were just yeah. instructed to treat them with kindness, um, which was not the best uh, on the church's part. No, but I mean, it was it was so universal. Mm -hmm. It was like breathing. Yeah. You know, they, they, their slaves were part of every society mm -hmm. across the, the world. It's it's an aberration in the modern times yeah. from, from his history of um, human history. And I know especially today we view it as like a race thing, but back then, no. you know, surely not. Anyone anyone, yeah, could, anyone could be a slave, a, yes. A, as a slave if you, got, if, if you had a bad turn of events, mm -hmm. especially if you're out at sea. Yeah. You know, your, your ship got... Uh, raided by a pirate, you're going into slavery mm -hmm. if you're not killed, and it doesn't matter who you were. Yeah, but yeah, so it's yeah, it it it's tied up in in race because America tied it up in race. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it had a functioning um, race based um, slave system, mm -hmm. and um, and before that, like is like we were talking about, it, it wasn't race based yeah. uh, at all mm -hmm. you know, because it's, or you know color based or whatever we want to say, like the Greek, ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, could have had, um, well, like slave, I think it's derivative of Slavs, which were actually hmm. the, the whites. Interesting. You know, the, the, uh, Northern and Western European, cause they're uh, sold into slavery. Hmm. I think, 
Don't quote Maybe. Me I'm not sure. That's that's I think an that's etymology true. that I don't know. Well, why don't you look that up I next could, time? I could. There's actually a book sitting right behind you, uh, all about el- etymologies. Lower behind you, down. Well, it's like yellow. There's 500 albums. There are a lot of I yeah. Can't, there are. Can't find any there's, books. there's a lot of stuff in my room. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yes. on the ju- organs, origins and justifications of private property. Yet. That is where we are. No, we're, we're still in there. Yes. Good. Let's um, move on. And so... <laughs> turning pages. Yes, I could hear you. Uh, for the for Christians, uh, there was a big question. <laughs> could you not do that? That's so loud. <laughs> um, for Christians... The listeners rooting for me. Uh, I bet. Um, the, the limits of economic activity were unclear, um, essentially, because you were told, you know, Charity, as said, she was, was the big question. If nobody acquired anything, there was nothing to give charitably, charitably but it was very easy to hide behind this justification and hoard wealth. Uh, sure. Of course, the idea that love of money is the root of evil, not necessarily money itself. Yeah, the acquisition of it's fine, mm-hmm. just don't love it. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so here's where we get into it's ownership. Like, it's like cheating on your wife. It's not wrong unless you love the other person. Is that how it goes? I don't oh, think okay. so. Right. <laughs> I think I think that's uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> the idea of ownership. I think the parallel is pretty accurate, though. I mean, because you're accumulating a whole bunch of, of wealth, mm-hmm. that you're really, you know, you're you're not doing a good thing either. That is true. All you're doing it for that purpose. Yes. Um, but yes, ownership was also unclear uh, because the king essentially owned everything that he right. governed as the feudal chain ran upwards. If he's in charge of all of these lower people, then necessarily all of their property should belong to him. Right. Uh, but the tenants below had the rights of possession and use of what they held of the king, but they did not have disposal rights. Uh, right. Those belonged to the owner of the property. Right. And so ownership basically meant having a better right than a competitor. Uh, and so the, the issues of ownership arise in times of hardship. You know, what duty do the rich have to share with the poor? You know, if my granary is full and yours has absolutely nothing and we're all dying, do I have an obligation to share that with you? That was one of the, the biggest questions of the time. Sure. Uh, and then churches also became dependent on members' taxes to function, raising the question of if the church should actually own anything. Uh, and this gave rise to the idea of corporate ownership and that the members owned collectively, not individually and that the Pope was the administrator of church property, not the owner. Right. So it belonged to the church, but not to any of the individual people within it. Yeah, and, and that that was beneficial to the church because then they owned it in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. The church did. Yes. And so, and it really didn't matter to the Pope because he was in charge of it for his natural life. So mm-hmm. what does it matter? When he dies, he didn't. He doesn't get to give it to his heirs. To yeah. Does he care? Um, and, and, and the whole feudal system was really inefficient because if you're just a tenement or tenant, you don't own it. Mm-hmm. What's, why, why would you improve it? Yeah. You know, I mean, and so it, it, the, the, the taking of ownership of, of property or uh, of land is so important to, to really the most effective use of the property, but that's mm-hmm. kind of a different, slightly different effective, yeah. uh, discussion. You know, the, the feudal system, he talks about, you know, from the down up, is really all top down. The king mm-hmm. owned everything, and you just have a right to use it yeah. and possess it until the king says otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there was another big issue with, with the church's property in terms of heirs. Uh, the way that, like, heirhood work um, was that when laymen gave their property to the church, the gift deprived the layman's feudal superior of the incidence of ownership. When a lay tenant bequeathed his property to his heir, his heir inherited after a payment in cash or kind to the superior from whom he held his property. These payments were, in effect, payment for a lease, paid when the lease was renewed or a new leasee put onto the lease. Uh, because like what you were saying, the church was immortal, it had no heirs. And so therefore, if land was, was paid to them, there would never be you know, any giving of money to, to the original heir, essentially. Well, I was reading it also in the opposite, mm-hmm. too, because if you can make an arrangement with the church, mm-hmm. that you provide the church with your right to use the land before you die mm-hmm. and uh, upon your death, then it, then they have the right to have it in perpetuity, yeah. but you have a, a side agreement so that your son can use the property mm. and his his heirs. So it ties it up uh, into a more permanent feudal state mm. where the church takes over uh, as a as a never dying entity mm. with a right to use the land. Interesting. Yeah, and he kind of mentions that makes more sense with how he says like the kings were the ones who had the biggest issues of this because right. you know if somebody below you you know, bequeath this property, then that's gone from you. You can't use it anymore. It belongs right. to the church. Right. Like, well, it's, it's, it's I'm out, out of luck. Yeah, it's out of your inventory. Mm-hmm. It's now, now it's off the books. It's now in the church's books. And um, and if you have these side deals, it really benefits the church because then you get all the, you know, all the use of the property, you get a cut of it. Mm-hmm. And then and it really practically speaking, the it, it doesn't change the management of the property because the same clan or family is still working the land and, and getting the, the revenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're just getting a cut to the, uh, to the church. Yeah. 
and the church has a certain amount of authority over him. So yeah, the king's not going to like that because yeah. you're 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 pulling diverting out the yeah all of his property. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, and the, that was a big issue um, with the the church and the government. But the issues of tithes and tax exemptions for the church also poisoned relations between the two for centuries. So tithes, you know, taxes paid to the church, correct? And then the, the, the church themselves did not pay taxes to the king, correct? Um, was was an issue for for a lot of kings and the church, right? Because the church ends up being a lot more wealthy, has more more cash, especially if you're going to have to have a, a a war with the neighboring uh, king. Mm -hmm. You know how do you how do you pay for the the war yeah. if, if the church has more money it's just sitting in there in their coffers mm -hmm. and they're not contributing anything to it yeah uh, but yet they're benefiting from the entire structure that's a it's a huge problem mm -hmm. uh, he also says that it became orthodox doctrine that property had at first been held in common but it was right to divide the inheritance of human race among individuals it gave each person to save uh, to care for what he held personally and this was acceptable only if some overarching notion of common good uh, that property institutions uh, served. So essentially, you know, previously, you know, everything was held in common, you know, sort of the, the, the Christian communism sort of idea, but it's good that we have these things, you know, individually given to us because we'll care for them more because they belong to us. Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a stewardship. Yes, exactly. Uh, view of the world is it very, very similar to um, uh, conservation theories. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're to conserve the land, you know, we can hunt the land, but we're there to conserve it for future mm -hmm. generations. Same, same philosophy. Which is interesting. I, I, this is kind of off topic, but the, the conservationism um, was like something uh, that the Republican party like was, was very in support of for a very long time. And they were kind of labeled. Still is. Well, it still right. is. Yes. Right. Uh, but they were, yes, right. but they were still labeled, you know, for many years as, you know, the, the party of, of the earth of the, the, the green people essentially. Um, but now it's, kind of reversed now the left with like the the further mm. uh different you know i guess climate climate change i don't know what, well, what label it, you want to put on it really it, uh, the transition uh, for the leftists uh really began like the earth day mm. uh in the 1970s where they they tried to say that you know because because the republicans were more developer friendly mm -hmm. although nixon's the one that signed the clean air act yeah. and nixon's the one that signed the clean water act mm -hmm. Um, so, so, but it, it's a difference between environmentalism and, cons uh, and conservation. conservationism. Yes, because conservation uh, views the, the, the generally uh, views it as the, we need to use it and preserve mm -hmm. it and make sure that it's clean and, and, yeah. and we improve the, the the environment, but that it's essentially there for human mm -hmm. use yes. and benefit and enjoyment. Mm -hmm. The environmentalists think that the environment is uh, almost a separate entity that needs to be supported and preserved outside of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be better if no humans were around yes. because then it would be just in a pure natural state. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's still a, str a struggle now because, uh, uh, but then, you know, the, the, you know like, uh, there's a lot of overlap between the communists, socialists, mm -hmm. and the environmentalists because they're all a bunch of left-wing nut jobs. <laughs> and by the, I always love to, uh, to post a story on Earth Day about the founder of Earth Day, mm. Oh yeah, you know, do you know you've the, told yeah, me about yes, this. Yeah, yes, because I, I, every April I, I have think to you said post this on, on the podcast media. last time. Uh, yeah, he, Earth he, Day was he coming around. Murdered his uh, his uh, living lover girlfriend, stuffed stuffed her in a trunk and fled to France. Yeah, and um, she it was, the murder was only discovered a long time later when the oozing uh, fluid uh, seeped seeped out of the trunk uh, through the floor and into the downstairs apartment. It's disgusting. Um, when uh, her, her body was discovered. So, you know, Earth Day is, is it was created by a person like that and is supported mostly by people who think like that. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Moving away from Earth Day, this is where we get uh, into the outside, uh, as, as Alan Ryan calls them, outside non-influences, um, the, the Muslim, and the, uh, Muslim and the Jewish communities. It says, the presence of Islamic states in North Africa and the Near East colored European politics beginning in the 8th century but Islam uh, could fundamentally have no impact on Western political thought. Uh, this is what Alan Ryan believes. It says that Islamic scholars explored uh, Islamic communities, but the Western distinction between the sacred and the secular uh, was very foreign uh, to the Islamic states. Correct. So if you're right. looking at everything as though they're one and the same, your political thoughts are not going to matter too much to somebody who thinks they're very different. Um, Arabic, Arab scholars uh, were important in philosophy, medicine, and technology, but overall not in politics. Uh, the impact of Islam was most largely in the military. They conquered all the way up even through southern France, um, and they were only pushed out of Sicily and Spain, but still exist in North Africa. Um, so they had a, a large military influence on a lot of southern Europe for some, uh, over a thousand years oh, easily. Yeah. I don't know the exact amount of time, but especially with like the Reconquista in Spain, that took right. hundreds of years. Correct. Um, right. uh, bloody wars. Um, 
But the interesting part was that conquered Jews and Christians within these Islamic states were tolerated if they accepted the political authority of Islamic rulers and paid extra taxes. That's right. Uh, and they allowed non-Muslim subjects some sort of uh, community autonomy, you know, mm-hmm. separate from, from the overall state. Uh, and similarly, Jews did not create distinctive moral and political ideas to the West. Uh, they had much to say about their own survival as a righteous community, but not much relevant to Western Christian thought as a whole, which... I mean, fair enough during this period of time, mm -hmm. you know, during the Middle Ages, they're just trying to survive. Yeah. Yeah. They were kicked out of, I think, just about every country that existed uh, in Europe. um, Yes and no. I Mm -hmm. mean, they had thriving communities. Yeah. But but they were set apart. They were always, yeah. They were always discriminated against. And, um, and, and, you know, the the Islam Mm -hmm. that was in place in these communities was uh, certainly more tolerant than some islamic countries mm-hmm. you know like i oh, mean you can't absolutely. be a practicing jew in saudi arabia mm-hmm. today but you certainly could in um uh i guess the moors they yeah. said the moors uh conquered more uh, spain, spain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. right because they had thriving communities mm-hmm. absolutely um and and treated better than when the uh, the recon- uh, reconquest yeah. happened with the inquisition and all mm-hmm. that stuff well, it's interesting, um, kind of what you said about them being like set apart, uh, the Jewish communities especially, because some people think that it was kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that's why they were blamed so often, because if you have like a horrible disaster that affects a larger state and they're in right. you know, economic ruin, but this one you know, enclave of Jewish communities, because they're so separate and they have you know, different you know, economic systems, if they keep flourishing, then it's like, well... They're still doing good. We're we're doing bad. It must have been their fault right. since that and you still further that. led to them, yep. you know, being excluded from the community and yep. kind of repeating the cycle all over again. See that modern times too. Mm-hmm. I mean, to this day in America, really? Oh yeah, hmm. that's a huge, uh, huge problems between the Afro- Af- African American community and some Jewish communities. Really? Oh yeah, like Jesse Jackson uh, referred to New York City as Heimie Town, which is a <laughs> derogatory. That was during his presidential campaign. Wow, in 1984. And he was he was a major uh, major candidate hmm. back then. It's, I think it was eighty four, eighty eight, certainly in the eighties. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, there was a lot of big controversy. But there were there were race riots. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton uh, yeah. uh, 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 incited a riot against a, a Jewish uh, neighborhood hmm. based upon a race hoax, and uh, people died. Wow. Yeah. And uh, never apologized for that. Uh, hmm. they got a lot of a lot of. Pay good paid speaking gigs and a hmm. job on MSNBC for years. Wow! Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a well known. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah and, and, it, and it's it's odd because there's so many people in the Jewish community there that were so involved and supportive of the um, uh, civil rights demonstrations in the '60s. Hmm. But then it it, it it's, it's very strange. Interesting. I, I don't I don't understand. Yeah, I've seen... I don't think know if it's any of it's rational. You know, mm-hmm. it's, just, it's like I don't know how all this stuff happened, and yeah. I'm not really in tune with either community yeah. that much. This isn't to that extent, but I did see recently. I think it was UC Berkeley um, established, or, or certain you know parts of the campus established that we will not have speakers here that support Zionism or Israel. We right. will just not host them ever. And yeah. it's like, well, that's a little right. little the no G yeah. zones. Yeah, ex- I mean, that's, essentially, that's, that's exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and well, you look at the squad members. A couple yeah. of them Rashida Tlaib mm-hmm. and uh, that uh, Somalian lady from uh, Michigan. What's her name? Oh, I can't think of it right now. I know yeah, who you're talking, you're talking about, about, but a uh, lady who uh, fooled around with her campaign manager, uh, divorced her husband. Oh, her. yeah. What's I can see name? her face. I can't. I can't yeah. remember her name. But yeah, I mean, so so it's current. You know, you, yeah. you, just, you just wait a couple months and you'll you'll see the examples of it. It doesn't mm. make any sense. I don't. Yeah. I don't get it. But it, it's one of those things that's out there. Crazy. Yep. Yes. All right, but we can skip over that. I mean, yes. We just discussed it. We just discussed it. To. Yes. Moving on to papal absolutism and the investiture controversies. Mm-hmm. This is one of the, the clearest examples of the issues between the church and the state. Um, and we see this beginning with Galasius I, who was pope between 492 and 496, and he wrote a letter in 494 that became known as the Doctrine of the Two Swords. And in this, he claimed that spiritual power is superior to the secular, secular power because in the last resort, the Pope answered to God for the morals of the emperor. So if I'm answering directly to God, I am higher than you. And so therefore, God grants authority to the Pope and the emperor, each absolute in his own sphere, um, and each should sustain the other's authority, but the Pope is the highest. Uh, and so with that, um, he kind of says, I'm going to read here from the book. There are two powers, August Emperor, by which this world is chiefly ruled, namely the sacred authority of the priests and the royal power. Of these, that of the priests is the more weighty, since they have to render an account for even the kings of men and the divine judgment. The letter went on to observe that there is a quid pro quo, with priests obeying the laws that the secular power made to preserve earthly peace and prosperity, and the emperor being willing to acknowledge the authority of the pope 
in matters of faith. So essentially, follow your follow each other's own things, separate spheres, but they do overlap in some situations. And in those cases, the, the Pope has authority. So it sounds like what the Supreme Court does nowadays. Yeah, it really does. We're, we're equals, and you have your sphere, but I get to decide whether you, you're doing your job. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, he says that this overall was a statement of the division of labors, uh, a denial of authority that the emperor seized in Constantinople, an assertion of autonomy and primacy of the papacy over all other patriarchs. So it wasn't just, you know, king and, and church relations. It was, you know, which emperor is the right emperor, and they're claiming, well, right. definitely the West. Yep. Um, and this uh, also... Uh, also uh, asserted uh, dominion over the Eastern Orthodox mm-hmm. Church as yes, well. Yes, true. And, and that didn't end very well either, because I think mm-hmm. they... Didn't they excommunicate, so to speak, the the church leadership of the Eastern Orthodox? I'm sure they did. That that's really what set the schism mm-hmm. in, in concrete. Yes, with rebar, <laughs> um, and we're still separated from them mm-hmm. officially. And he's uh, it's also claimed the Pope's right to judge an emperor's fitness for office and almost any other secular ruler under the Holy Roman Emperor <laughs> later. So basically, anyone in Europe that the Church could say whether they were fit to rule. Um, And so this led to the investiture controversy of the mid-11th century. As bishops were controllers of territory and other property, they were also expected to provide military support, and there became two practices uh, from this. And the first was proprietary churches. Uh, The lay donor who established a church and endowed it with property owned the church and installed who he would or who he wanted there on his own terms. And from there we get the lay investiture. The bishop was invested with the bishopric by a secular ruler in some way, in the same way a tenant received a fief. So he did homage to the king, Uh, for his diocese. Uh, And so this uh, really uh, enhanced the authority of the church, but endangered their spiritual mission. It gave them more, you know, physical power. um, But the buying of the ordination was the sin of simony, but was widely practiced even by popes. Uh, And that was a very big issue uh, because this uh, um, uh, led to a lot of reformers. Uh, It was the the target of, of many of the reformers in the 11th century. They set out to ensure that the pope was elected by the College of Cardinals and nobody else. And so this reduced the influence of the Roman aristocracy and was put in place to avoid things like the scandal of the uh, of the 1040s, where three people claimed papal authority. And this is interesting. Uh, I'm reading from the book. He says, when the Council of Sutri in 1046 removed Benedict IX, Sylvester III, and Gregory VI, trouble was narrowly avo- averted. The pious Henry III refused to receive his imperial crown from Gregory VI because he had bought the papal tiara from Benedict IX and was therefore guilty of the sin of simony. But he installed his own choice as Clement II and was unwilling to give up the principle that just as the emperor in Constantinople appointed the patriarch, so the Holy Roman Empire would, emperor would nominate his choice for election as pope. So a lot of names there just yes. going back and forth like, well, I bought it from you, but that makes me unfit to be emperor. So I'm going to put still my own choice in right. as pope because I can pay for this since there are three separate people who, who could reasonably within the terms set forth there reasonably claim uh, authority to be pope what a mess yeah what a complete mess ridiculous and it also uh, these reformers also set out to eliminate uh, lay investiture uh, the archbishop slash the pope would invest a bishop with no lay involvement and this led to the concordat of worms which established the papacy as a quasi monarchical system with the pope as the absolute head in spiritual matters and as a powerful secular institution, particularly in Italy. And they also set out to secure the Catholic primacy in Christendom. Uh, But this was a total failure, uh, and the breach between the East and the West still remains today. So they tried to solve some issues, um, and to some extent they did, but it also created a lot more problems in the future as well. Um, And and the the beauty of having the investiture is mm -hmm. they have some accountability. Um, The the problem is it's a different kind of accountability Mm -hmm. being by a civil authority. You know, a, a lot of number of non-denominational churches around here have a, a council of uh, I call them parishioners, but they're, mm-hmm. they don't call them. I don't think they call themselves parishioners generally, but of the of the church members, and mm-hmm. they hire a minister. They'll, they'll interview mm-hmm. uh, people that have a divinity degree, yeah. and I think and, they're and, pretty frequently called elders, the elders yes, of the yeah, church, elders yeah. of the church, and and they tend to overlap with who who's the most generous donors mm-hmm. usually. Um, and so so there's still a lot of that similar stuff mm-hmm. going on, but of course. The idea behind the elders is that they are devout mm-hmm. and they're trying to find somebody to yeah. lead them in a spiritual rather than a civil mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, movement, I guess yeah. you'd say. But you know, some of these churches have a lot of assets. Mm-hmm. You know, like that, what, what's that one? Um, Joyce Meyer's ministry, mm. multi-million dollar operation out of uh, High Ridge, wow. Northern Jefferson County. They have a huge campus up there. 
uh, they, they, I don't know how big they are now, but they were huge because they self-published uh, books and she was a mm. televangelist and all that. Interesting. It was international. Wow. Um, right down the street from, from where we live and, mm. and uh, a non-denominational type, yeah. type deal. Now, Interesting. I don't know who selected her. Other than, <laughs> I think she has a corporate board of directors yeah. and all that stuff. But, Fascinating. Yeah, I think yes. her family works for her and all that stuff. Mm. But, yeah. yeah. There you anyway. Go. Yes. So there's some, some of that kind of those same issues mm-hmm. are still present with you know, different church yeah. organizations. And I mean, now, of course, we have the Catholic Church, which is which has is its com- host of other issues. It's completely unaccountable to anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of uh, it almost stems from this in a way that in like trying to remove the power um, of you know the kings and everything, which maybe I mean they probably should have done, sure. but at the same time they increased their own power over right. themselves, and now they have right. no accountability from the outside. So right. it's like. Which one do you want? Which is the better situation? Right. I almost wish that there was a better balance between the two, but I don't yeah, know quite there, how it would work. There's got to there's there's got to be a change so mm-hmm. that the parishioners, yeah, the Catholics have some mm-hmm. sort of yeah, role I, or oversight. Or there ha, there should be some way, and, and also I think it was mentioned in here uh, that resignation of a pope was never even mm-hmm. contemplated because it was it was a divine right. Yeah, you're from, absolute from, you're, from Peter down through and your divine right from mm-hmm. god to rule we've had a resignation yeah. we have two popes now. yeah yeah the pope, he's a resigned and, and nobody's really explained why he resigned. yeah um and i i suspect it's not because he was too good of a person to be pope <laughs> uh, just, just a cynical take i think there might have been something else going on other than he's too perfect yeah, no, I, I do agree that there has to be some sort of accountability there, but I'm like torn between how much because... So how to do it. Yeah, how to do it because, I mean, of course, you know, matters of faith aren't really like, should not be decided by just a majority. Like that right. is not like... But this you know, is a, a matter of administration. Thing. Yes. So they, they, they don't make a distinction between administration and, and doctrine mm. within the administration yeah. of the Catholic Church. They, and they're, they're right to an extent that it, they are all intertwined mm-hmm. as... as uh, one of Reagan's uh, advisors famously said, personnel is policy. Mm. You know, when you're doing running the government, and Trump never figured this out, <laughs> personnel, the people you put in, in, in the positions mm-hmm. of power are just as important as the yeah. policies to, that you pursue. And to so a lesser extent, thing. what Justinian was saying, you know, when Correct. the king speaks, you know, he makes law. I mean, to a lesser extent, when you know, your administrators speak, they are speaking on behalf of right. the institution. And so, so like, the, the priests are spiritual leaders, but they're also administrators in their parishes. Mm-hmm. Same thing for bishops. And so if there needs to be some separation between mm-hmm. the administration or really, even if they just separated the money side, yeah. they, would, they would solve a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. And they, if they had more formal power of lay boards for essentially employee discipline issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know uh, you've told me about like the canon law issues with that sort of stuff about how, isn't they have to go through like three different systems of law essentially to like look at, um, well, canon law is a separate legal system. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, the, the, it's actually a, 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 it's a separate governmental entity. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is the arch, that that is the Vatican. The Vatican is a country and they, uh, the Vatican ultimate authority for all the Catholic property within within every the world, goes through canon law and mm-hmm. the administration of it. What's really bizarre when you look at the canon law, or the preamble to like the 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 the, uh, the digest or the summary of canon law, they have a huge emphasis on uh, they're trying to limit the people that will actually study it to mm-hmm. those that are only doing it in a, in a certain uh, spiritual scope of love and whatever and, <laughs> and to try to dissuade people from studying to fi- try to figure out how screwed up the system is but yeah. they have all sorts of affirmative defenses which i know is screwing up their ability to to defrock priests mm-hmm. because a vol- like for instance voluntary intoxication is a legal defense uh, uh, for offenses that priests commit uh so really? it, yes and that's that it, it used to be more common in common law that if you got drunk you weren't really responsible for things hmm. you did when you're drunk well, in Missouri, the exact opposite is true. Yeah. If you're voluntarily intoxicated and you do a bunch of shit, you are just as responsible for it as if you planned it out on paper <laughs> because it's too bad you got yourself intoxicated. Yeah. Now, if somebody drugs you and you murder somebody, that's a legal defense because it's involuntary mm-hmm. intoxication. It's hard to prove, yeah. but you know if you can prove that. But if, if, if you like somebody slips you a, you know, yeah. a loaded drink and you can prove that, but voluntary intoxication should not be a defense. Mm-hmm. And so you see a lot of this alcohol abuse and uh, controlled substance abuse and child molestation. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know this because you, you're, nobody's ever privy to the proceedings. But, yeah. I, but I suspect that a lot of these priests are still priests after they get caught molesting the first or second time. 
because, because voluntary, voluntary intoxication huh. is, is a legal defense to any child molestation wow. that you do. Hmm. Uh, because you really weren't in the right mind. It's not a sin yeah. if you didn't know what you're doing. Now, it's hard to prove mm -hmm. how much you knew or didn't know uh, and how, how drunk you were yeah. without a blood test. Mm. So it's, it's a, and there's, there's several examples of that in canon law. I don't need to go through all that, but it's a separate legal system. Yeah. And it's, it's very similar to the old English common law um, system. And it hasn't not been updated mm -hmm. as it needs to be in the more sophisticated times with regard to yeah. intent and legal defenses and with the understanding that a defendant will not honestly pursue legal defenses. Yeah. You know, they'll pursue whatever legal defense that is available to them. Yeah. It, whether it's canon well, it's, law or not. That's what he said earlier in this chapter. You know, will people follow the law because they know the law or will they just look for reasons out of it, essentially? But, you know, well, generally, I would say this as a general rule. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're molesting children, you're not going to be <laughs> honestly applying the law that as is, it applies to that is you a good point. and the appropriate punishment. Mm -hmm. That's an extreme example. But when you're stealing from, you know, you're stealing for something and you're you're going out carousing. Yeah. Uh, or using money from the church to pay for prostitutes. A pretty common occurrence. Mm. Um, you know, that, that, you know, but you say, well, I was really drunk. You know, I'm an alcoholic. And they might be alcoholics. Yeah. You know, that's a sad life. It's a tough life mm -hmm. uh, to be a priest and be celibate and all that kind yeah. of stuff, which is another whole other issue. But anyway, so I, I, I digress. Yes. But good points connecting it to the, the present day. I'm trying to. Yes. Uh, moving on to the last section, this is the only point in the chapter where we get like a description of one particular person's political views. And this is John of Salisbury, who was born around 1110, uh, and by the end of his life, he was the Bishop of Chartres. And he wrote the Polycraticus, or the Book of the Statesman, which was a handbook to rulers to remind them of their duty. So very similar to a lot of the things that we were seeing back in the ancient times of, you know, how should a king, you know, rule. Um, and so he resurrected the ancient argument for tyrannicide. He discusses the differences between a priest, or not a priest, a prince and a tyrant, and introduced the novel category of an ecclesiastical tyrant. You know, just because you're a priest does not mean you are free from being a tyrant. Um, he says the authority of a true king is divine, but is rejected at, and, is at, and, and is rejected at the peril of our souls and bodies. But God only gives kings authority in order that they conduct themselves in law-abiding fashion and serve law and justice, and attend to the welfare of the people over whom God has seen fit to place them. So if you're not fulfilling those conditions, you're not a true king. Right. You're not using the authority that God has given you properly. And therefore, revolution is, uh, is mm -hmm. appropriate, but the, the hard part is figuring out where that line is. Yeah, because he says, you know, a true king practices justice. That's the real mark of his uh, being God's agent, you know, is if he's practicing justice. Uh, and doing things, uh, you know, for whose sake uh, that God has invested kings. Is he doing things for the people? Uh, and so unjust rule is tyranny. Tyranny, ty ty excuse me, tyrants do not have God's authority, uh, and so their people do no wrong if they resist and kill him. And the killing of a public tyrant is a meritorious act. So these examples came from the Old Testament, and he was milder and more ro uh, moderate than Roman tyrannicide. Um, and he says, a prince's whim is not law, but when guided by equity and justice to do good, he lays down the law. So just because he says something doesn't make it good. It has to be, you know, supported by, by good reasons. Right. Um, he says, the pope is the servant of the servants of God, and the king is the servant of the common good according to law. And so he is exempted from the law that he gives insofar as the exemption serves the public good. So still a little bit of that sovereign immunity. Yeah. It's good to be the king. Yes, exactly. He says that there's a difference between a tyrant forfeiting authority and uh, not being able to complain if the people kill him and uh, it being somebody's duty to kill him. So it's not necessarily, you know, Cicero's or the, the Roman opinion that, you know, it is your duty to kill a tyrant. Right. He's just saying there's nothing wrong in killing a tyrant if he is truly a tyrant. Right. Um, so not that it's, you know, bad to not kill him, but it is correct. not bad to not kill. Well, right. yes, something like that. You yeah. know what I mean? You're not required, but yes. you're permitted. But you're permitted. It's yes. up to you. Yes. It's up to you, but, you know, it's, it's You know, not, maybe if you want to, you know, you, you can to, go ahead. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying you got to do it, yes. but, um, you know, he doesn't seem to be too good of a guy. Uh, you know, it'll leave it up to you whether you want to kill him. Uh, he also <laughs> says, uh, going with the ecclesi ecclesiastical tyrants, he says, if it's lawful to kill tyrants, it must also be lawful to kill clerical tyrants. And he points to the Old Testament stories about killing the priests of Baal. Uh, I don't know says, that story. I meant to look that up before this. Did you? Did, I don't know uh, that story. I'm guessing pagan priests were killed by probably the Israelites, I, if I had to guess. Pagan priests? Well, I mean, if they're serving Baal. Well, I thought there was a location. No, Baal is, a, is some sort of 
I think the church considers him a, a demon, but I think he was a god to, to some certain group of people at one point in time. Oh, is that right? Uh-huh. I think so. That's where a lot of like church demons uh, or Catholic demons come from. Is just um, uh, like other people's uh, ideas of, of gods. Like Beelz- Beelzebub comes from some other is word. Babylon. Babylon? Was Beelze- Beel- Beelzebub from Babylon? I don't know. I don't know. I think they just have both both have bees. I think that's where you're coming from. But while you're looking that up, um, <laughs> I'm going to read the conclusion here. He says, in short, a writer like John in the 12th century could draw on a great variety of intellectual resources to make some striking points about the conditionality of both secular and ecclesiastical authority and about the limits beyond which ordinary people are not to be pushed. There's an obvious moral to be drawn. We should neither exaggerate the closeness of such thinkers to ourselves, nor treat them as though they were so distant in space and time that their ideas need decoding as if they were a Mayan, as if they were Mayan hieroglyphs concerned with a wholly inscrutable way of life. So he's essentially saying at the end of this chapter, we should look at this, this middle age period as, you know, not something that's 100%, you know, up to date. We, all of our ideas aren't the same, but they are, you know, similar enough to us that we could draw examples from them. Yes. And I, I think, um, he may be understating the influence on modern political philosophy, mm-hmm. on the Middle Ages on modern political philosophy. Yeah. I guess I would say is it's more practical than maybe philosophical. Mm-hmm. So I guess he, he you know, I'm not disputing. He's obviously an expert better than I am. Yeah. But, uh, but there, there, a lot of the stuff that was created during the Middle Ages as far as the relationship between the, the mm-hmm. state and the people that still is kind of in existence yeah. now was created then too. I mean, you know, I know the, you know, the Greeks had the, the philosophy and the Romans had uh, their views and their structure, which is heavily, heavily influenced, um, you know, the United States founding. But a lot of these uh, rules about uh, or these thoughts about the relationship between the church and state and, mm-hmm. um, and, um, the the authority of the government vis-a-vis the the people were really discussed during yeah. this period of time too in maybe a little bit more of a practical yeah. way rather than a you know, general philosophical text. I was, I was having a conversation with somebody i forget how it started but they essentially said something along the lines of you know i don't really look at like any sort of thinking you know uh, before like the 17th century you know it, it doesn't matter before then the only things that matter are what are more modern I'm like well not really. I mean, we've been looking at the same issues that we've been talking about this entire time. I mean, we were looking at Augustine last week in the, the 400s and talking about, you know, punishment and the death penalty. And those right. are still conversations that we're having. And like, right. just because it's old does not mean that it's like no longer useful. Well, I think uh, that person is both right and wrong because nothing since the 1700s is new. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all borrowed ideas from Plato and, Plato yeah. and Aristotle and, and the, the, the thinkers that came after them. Yeah. Because there are fundamental questions of mm-hmm. the relationship uh, between, well, what what is, mm-hmm. uh, what is God? Uh, do we have souls? I yeah. mean, you're talking about the 1700s. What what great um, breakthroughs in philo- philosophy have happened mm. since the 1700s? I mean, not many that I can think of. I mean, really? we've. That's... I mean, this is what we talked about, like all in season one. You know, as we're getting to the modern day, it's like, well, this is just this person's idea rephrased. You know, it's like the, the whole right. living in a simulation thing, you know, how can we trust our senses? I mean, I think that's the same thing that, like, Plato and Augustine were talking Absolutely. about. Or Plato and Aristotle, sorry. Plato, it's like, Plato you know, and Aristotle, yeah. Plato was, was like, this This is just a, yeah, there's a veil. It's just an image, yeah. yeah I mean, it's like, this is an image of what, what is uh, pure, mm-hmm. of what God really created. We don't really even know what is, is. Yeah. Uh, go back to Bill Clinton. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so it's, yeah, so I, I, whatever i mean yeah. it, it's hard to go to, to to read these and i i, I don't read the original text because mm-hmm. i'm sure there'd be i do on occasion i don't know latin although i studied it in college and mm. almost failed <laughs> <laughs> well lucky for you yes. i'm learning spending my time wisely and learning both greek and latin Good so hopefully you. maybe yes. yeah are there any other dead languages you want to learn um I mean, Old English would be cool. It would uh, be very cool. Is Swahili, that's a real live language, isn't it? Yes. It's okay. like one of the biggest languages in Africa. Okay. I was thinking there was like an African language that was more popularized, but it doesn't really exist as a live language. Man, oh, I, I don't be, know. It completely could be completely I mean, wrong. Hebrew is kind of that, and so is Arabic to an extent. Like Hebrew was a, a revitalized language, essentially. Mm. Like people didn't really speak Hebrew um, like there was a gap in Hebrew's history from, I don't right. know, I don't know the dates, but up until essentially like the, the foundation of Israel when they decided, hey, we need like an official 
Sarah language Rice. to an I extent. Did not know that. I mean, there were modified forms. You know, Hebrew had influence like Yiddish and things Yiddish. like that. Yes. Okay. Um, but it wasn't like nobody spoke the, the Hebrew that's considered like the, the official language of Israel. Is that right? Um, and it's a similar thing with Arabic too. Like there is one specific Arabic that is classical Arabic or, or Quranic right. Arabic, okay. but nobody speaks that. They is all that speak right? dialects of Arabic. Like there's huh. Egyptian Arabic, Moroccan Arabic, I don't know, Saudi Arabian Arabic, whatever you say, but they're all different than the actual Arabic that's in the Quran. Yes. A little bit of linguistic trivia for is, you there. It is interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. What did you think of this this chapter overall? I know we kind of mentioned some of the things there. but Well, I th- I think I'm preoccupied with creating the new people's... I know. This, this <laughs> overshadowed our actual discussion this time. Uh, I'm obsessed with, okay, let's see. Should I be a sponsor of it? If I'm a sponsor <laughs> of it, how do I, how do I get... Uh, Sponsored <laughs> by your law firm. No, for, can't right on the that. back. Can't, can't do that. My partners would be unhappy with me. <laughs> The real people's pamphlet. Yes, uh, that's really what I've been thinking about mm. while we're. Yes, yeah, so I, I no. I think the, the the Middle Ages are, are mm-hmm. interesting. These discussions are certainly interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, the 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 relationship between the church and state is just such a fascinating discussion, and and you still have, you know, the the the, the discussions in modern times don't have the um, specific church or Bible references, mm-hmm. but they're still the same moral arguments. Yeah. You know, you know the the uh, global warming people uh, talk about those issues in very moral mm-hmm. terms, in very religious terms, that without mentioning that, that it's part of their religion. Yeah. Uh, because they're talking about what's the right thing to do as opposed to what's the practical thing mm-hmm. to do. This is this is what's right and correct and the moral thing to do. Uh, and and you say, well, why don't we just build a bunch of nuclear power plants? <laughs> well, that's not the right thing to do for mm-hmm. Mother Earth or whatever the thing is. Mm-hmm. And, well, why don't we just dam more rivers and get yeah. hydroelectric activity, uh, electricity? Uh, but you'll drown these other plants. Well, if we're all going to die in 10 years anyway, why don't we flood some, you know, s- snail darters or something or, <laughs> you know, endangered species? Why well, knock a couple of them off? We're going to save humanity. <laughs> uh, what kind of weirdo are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Really? Yeah. You know, so, but, but, but what I'm trying, I shouldn't be making those points, but yes. my point is that there's still mm-hmm. this, uh, religious aspect uh, in, in relation to mm-hmm. the public policy discussions, but it's not as formal yeah. as it, it was back then. You had a formal church, a formal church doctrine, formal church administration. Now you have these amorphous, quasi-religious, yeah. public service NGOs. Mm-hmm. Like all the youth want to be, I want to form my own NGO. I want to work for an NGO non- yeah. or, or, or a nonprofit. Yeah. I want to work for a nonprofit. And that's really their religion. Mm-hmm. They want to join the, the, the nonprofit hmm. church. Interesting. Because they used to become priests and yeah. nuns. Hmm. And I know like th- th- this chapter focused, you know, more on religion than any other chapter, but I think yes. it's that's still I mean, it's not new. I mean, this still happened in the, the Roman Empire. Correct. It's just it was inherent within the Roman Empire. You didn't yes. have to set up separate distinctions, and that's what we're seeing here. But right. it's like, you know, it was it was always the case. It's mm-hmm. just here we're seeing it more clearly split. Correct. But it's right. it's interesting. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts that you'd like to add, or should we wind things down here? Let's wind it down, baby. Let's wind things down. All right, I've been Adam Bishop. I am Comrade Mark Bishop. Comrade Mark Bishop, <laughs> and this has been the, the People's Podcast, uh, uh, Unlimited Opinions. Thank you for listening to us tonight. out an article to write for the the new people's paper the proper people's well, the paper first thing we have to do is design a flag <laughs> <laughs> we have to have icons <laughs> but i think our paper has to have at least three hammer and sickles mm. chinese star type mm-hmm. stuff we, we have to get all that stuff in there like yes. the margins and uh the real the real people's uh, paper. the real has to be in like red yes of yes. course of course people's is it people's paper people's paper yes it's fantastic. <laughs> I, I'm absolutely going to write an article for the real people's paper. <laughs>